invite you to take your Bibles and uh, open with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, so we will be celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper this morning, and we do this uh, at this point as a church on a quarterly basis. And the reason that we are doing that is in order to be able to devote the entire service to better understanding the Lord's Supper, to uh, teaching on it, and to being able to come to uh, an understanding together as a church of what the Lord's Supper is and how we should partake in it, uh, because we live in a uh, community that has a lot of diversity in religious backgrounds, and so you can have anything from uh, Christian churches to churches that claim to be Christian but don't preach the Christian gospel to uh, churches that don't claim to be Christians, religions that don't claim to be Christians at all. And so if, if somebody has come from a background that maybe claimed Christianity but didn't preach the Christian gospel, the Lord's Supper could be another work another effort, another thing that we do, like going to confession or praying a rosary. And that's, that's not it. And so we want to we understand this rightly. And, and one, of the, one of the fundamental questions, because we have so much diversity in re- religious background, one of the fundamental questions is, what is your greatest need as a human being? What is your greatest need as a human being? And how is that need met? So for some, they might say my greatest need as a human being is to be a moral person to do the right things. Okay? Somebody else might say that my greatest need as a human being is to uh, accomplish my part in salvation. God does his part, now I need to do my part. And some might say that the greatest need that we have as humanity is to be forgiven. I I disagree with all of those. I think that what Scripture shows us is that the greatest need that humanity have or has is a need to be reconciled to a God that we have been alienated from because of our sin. So the picture is, if, if you've been here with me in Romans... The picture is you are dead apart from Christ. You are hostile to God. You are an enemy of God, even though you might do good moral things. All of us deep down inside know that apart from Jesus Christ, we're alienated from God. And so the greatest need that we have is for that alienation to be dealt with in the form of reconciliation. And to use the language that we've been talking about in Romans, we need the spirit of adoption as sons. We need to be part of God's family, not part of the horde of enemies that are laying siege to his sovereignty and his rule. We need to submit ourselves to God in right relationship with God. In order for that to happen, a few other things have to happen. For example, redemption and forgiveness. You see where I'm going with this? So redemption and forgiveness, though they are great truths of the gospel and uh, necessary for our salvation, they are not the greatest end of the gospel. The greatest end of the gospel is fellowship with God and Redemption and forgiveness serve those two, uh, those two things serve that one great purpose of reconciling us to God in right relationship. Now, what does this have to do with communion? What it has to do with communion is the fact that when we come to the Lord's Supper, we celebrate and remember what Christ has done for us in order to accomplish that great aim of the gospel, namely reconciliation. We come to celebrate and glory in God that though we were once enemies to God, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the language that Paul uses in Ephesians. And so my aim this morning is to help us understand what role or what the, what the purpose of redemption and forgiveness are in that great end, 
to which we are celebrating or of which we are celebrating this morning. So Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 3 just because context matters in, in reading the Bible. And I'm going to read verses 3 through uh, uh, 13 or 14, but we're going to be focusing only on verse 7 this morning. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us before the foundations of the world that we might be holy and blameless in him, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he, um, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, for forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things together in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Now, the reason I read that context is because there's a few things that jump out Uh, one of the primary things that jumps out is to the praise of his glory, 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 to the praise of his glory. God is doing all of these things in order that his glory and his grace might be praised. So what exactly is God doing? What is the role of redemption and forgiveness in reconciliation? Look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. There are four things that we're going to see this morning, and each one won't take very long. But um, I want us to see four things. Number one, in him we have redemption. In him we have redemption. Now, first of all, in who? In context, in Christ. One of the major things about Ephesians chapter 1 is in him, in him, in Christ, in the beloved, in him. That union with Christ through faith, we have been united with Christ. And that's just fancy language for saying that our lives are tied together. What's true of Christ is true of us. What's true of us is true of Christ. We're tied together. So the way it works is... When Christ goes to the cross, he takes our sin and our guilt and our shame and pays the full penalty of God's wrath for that. And in exchange, he gives us his righteousness, his holiness, his right standing before the Father, his perfect obedience credited to us, all of that by faith. We're united together. It's kind of like the illustration I like to use is a husband and a wife. One uh, has immeasurable riches. The other one is in tremendous debt. When you go and you get married, the two become one flesh. It's not just his debt or her debt and his wealth or her wealth. It's ours. That's union. That's what it means to be united with Christ. In him, we have redemption. Now, who's the we? Is it everybody? I mean, are we universalists? Is it... If it's talking about we, is he talking about everybody? Two things. Number one, it says in him. So all those that are in him are the we. But the second thing is chapter 1, verse 5. In him, or in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So the ones that are the, the we in Ephesians 1, 7 are those who have been predestined for adoption as sons, those who are children of God. And remember back to Romans. How do we know we're children? We have the Spirit. 
So this is talking explicitly and exclusively about believers. And it says, in him we have redemption. Now, I want to take the opposite approach real quick. That means that outside of him, we don't have redemption. And are in desperate need of redemption. So if there are those that are in him, and those that are in him have redemption, that means that there are those that are outside of him, and those that are outside of him are in need of redemption. This is going to, this is, we're not going through Ephesians, but this becomes very significant when he talks in chapter 2 about you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is, worked, uh, uh, that is at work now in the sons of disobedience, following the passions of the mind and the flesh, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, did something about that. He redeemed us. So in him we have redemption. What is redemption? It basically just means we've been bought back. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased back. So the first thing that we need to see is that all of God, when it comes to redemption, is all of God's blessings come to us in Jesus Christ. Not outside of Jesus Christ. All of these blessings come to us in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That means that if you are in Christ, you have everything that you need. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And one of those blessings, according to verse 7, is redemption. And it's only found in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says all of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. The second thing we need to see about redemption is that Christ paid the price to free us from the power and penalty of sin. Let's talk about buying back which talk about redemption. It's talking about Christ freeing us from the power of sin and the penalty of sin, deliverance from sin and its effects. So to think of the term redeemed, let's think of some Old Testament examples. Number one would be one that uh, might be familiar with, maybe not, but Boaz, right? Naomi and Ruth, um, Naomi's husband died, or I'm sorry, Naomi, uh, Ruth's husband died. There's a massive amount of debt they're in trouble. They can't pay the debt. These two ladies are off on their own. And the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, comes and buys back all of their family possessions. The second one that we're probably more familiar with is the Exodus. When God redeemed Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And that becomes a pattern that points forward to God's future redemption of his people from the power and penalty of sin. In other words, God did something in our redemption that we could not do. You don't go and redeem yourself. You need to be redeemed. And so many religions all around the world are focused on trying to redeem yourself to redeem your standing with God, to buy back your standing with God by your religious rituals or your uh, works of righteousness that you do on your own apart from God's empowerment and apart from Jesus Christ. God acted to do something we cannot do for ourselves. God paid the price by sending his son And we receive this. We don't earn it. We receive it by faith. We don't add to it. You can't add to your redemption. Just FYI. You're either redeemed or you're not. You can't be a little redeemed and you need to finish up the rest of it. Redemption means that Christ paid the price the price to free us from the power and penalty of sin. And is that not what Paul says in Romans chapter 6? If then you have been united with Christ in a baptism like his, uh, and will be raised with Christ, what then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can you who are dead to sin continue to live in it? 
The third thing about redemption is that we can really know that we have redemption here and now. We have it. Look at what it says. In him, we have redemption. It, 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 there's, you know, like when you're uh, in college and, and somebody wants to add a word and they put that little, like, echelon type of symbol and then write the word above? Right? Don't do that in your Bible. I know that nobody's probably sitting there writing in, we have potential for redemption or we have a... Uh, possibility of redemption. I know you're not writing that in your Bibles right now. Uh, If you do, I'm going to take your pens away. That's bad. Don't do that. Uh, But we don't always have to write it in the Bible to read it into the Bible through our own experiences and through our own lens. There There are a lot of people that do that. And they read this, and in him we have redemption. Well, that would be nice. Maybe someday, if I'm good enough. The point is, if you are in Christ, if you are adopted as a child of God, you have redemption. It is yours. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. How do we know we have redemption? I'm sorry, verse 8. The way we know we have redemption is this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And the result of this redemption is joy and gratitude, love and affection for Christ, adoration and worship. Because it's done. Everything that's necessary has been done. Look at Colossians. Colossians is before Galatians. Nope, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There we go. Um, Colossians chapter 1. Look at verses 21 to 22. Colossians 1, 22, 21 to 22. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which, of which I, Paul, became a minister. We're redeemed to be reconciled. Look at what he says there. Verse 22, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh. We've been reconciled to God. That means redeemed people are sons. Redeemed people have a new relationship with God. Sin stands in the way, in other words, of relationship. My alienation needs to be dealt with. That's dealt with in redemption. I'm bought back. But what about my sin? Look at the second thing I want us to see is in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Redemption requires forgiveness. That means that we have forgiveness of our trespasses. We have it. Now, we sing that song here sometimes. Uh, Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What love could remember, what wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Like, think about that image. God takes our sins and cast them into a sea that is so deep that they'll never reach the bottom and so vast that it cannot ever wash up on shore and haunt you. So many of us have this view of God's forgiveness that he, yeah, he throws it into a little puddle and then the waves come and they move in and it like washes up on shore and now here I am, I'm stuck looking at this thing that I thought was taken care of and, and here it is washing up over and over and over again. 
In other words, our specific, shameful, embarrassing sins that try to condemn us are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Go over with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1, verse 5 through 8. For this reason, and that this reason is verse 3, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. For, so verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus." Now, so many of us read that and we're like, oh man, that's discouraging. That might be one of the most discouraging passages in the entire Bible. Because if I look at my life, I don't see a lot of brotherly affection growing and I don't see love growing and I don't see steadfastness growing. In fact, I'm really struggling with those things. Remember what I said about interpreting the Bible context as king? Read the next verse. Verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. For so many people, the biggest barrier for actually living out a life that looks something like what we see in the Bible that a Christian should be living out is you've forgotten that you were forgiven. Your view of God's forgiveness is so small that you're incapable of growing in these virtues that Peter lists because what you've done is you've equated God's forgiveness to the way that you forgive others. And we all know how that pans out. I'll give, I'll give you like one or two. But by number three, oh boy, am I dropping the hammer. God's forgiveness is not like that. So what does this look like? How does this work? We sin, and what we've been talking about in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We, the, this conviction comes about sin through the seeing of God's truth and his word. We respond then in confession and repentance. And then we have these beautiful passages like 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then the enemy comes and whispers in our ear and says, you really think so? You really? Do you really believe it? Do you realize how horrible you are? The enemy comes and reminds us of, like, how can God forgive you when, when you're, you're so poor at forgiving others? When you're holding a grudge for something that happened so long ago, how can he forgive you? The enemy comes and whispers these lies into our ear and tries to undermine our confidence in God's forgiveness. Because if he can do that, all of those virtues that Peter lists out are hindered. Because we are short-sighted and blinded and we don't think back to the fact and remind ourselves of the fact that we are forgiven. Let me read you something that might be helpful to you. This is a quote that's attributed to Martin Luther. I'm not sure if he said it or not. I can't find the citation for it. If he didn't say it, he could have said it because it's right in line with his character. If he did say it, yeah, he said it. Uh, if not, if he, you know, if he didn't say it, he should have said it, and I'll just say it for him. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is what it says. So when the devil throws your sins in your face, you're in the whisper, thinking about the, the things that we've done and the ways that we've failed, being reminded by somebody else. When the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, the, the guilt rising up, 
How could God save me? How could God forgive me? I can't be confident that I have eternal life and salvation in Christ. Tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? That's not, if that's not Luther, I don't know what is. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. My child agrees with that. So then we ask the question, well, aren't some sins too bad? Look back in... Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have the redemption, or have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Let that sit for a second and marinate. Our forgiveness, God's forgiveness of us, the, the scope and the depth the, the amount that he'll forgive and the number of times he's willing to forgive it are directly proportional to how rich he is in grace. You see that? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses in proportion to, according to, as an overflow of the riches of his grace. I want, to, I want to linger here for just one moment, and I want to tie a couple of things together. Isaiah, in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God will abundantly pardon according to the riches of his grace, verse 8, which he lavished upon us. He's not stingy with his grace. He lavishes grace. The idea is like a, a wave that's coming onto the shore, and it just keeps coming and keeps coming, wave after wave after wave after wave, and it just never, never ends. The riches of his grace. How rich is God? How endless is the supply of his grace? Look at a few chapters over to Isaiah chapter 44. Because if you're still struggling with this, can God forgive these things that are so bad? Can God forgive these things that I keep messing up? Isaiah chapter 44 verse 22 says this. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Blotted them out like a cloud. Clouds obscure seeing things. And your sins like a mist, the mist disappears as the sun burns it off. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Redemption and forgiveness are tied together there. So how bad was Israel? Israel's pretty bad, right? I mean, Israel goes into the wilderness, and within days of arriving at this mountain where they're supposed to be communing with God, and God's presence is there, they build a false idol. Or go over to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. Isaiah 43, verse 25 says, I, this is God speaking, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. God's abundant, lavish, 
rich grace is given to us so that we are redeemed and our sins are forgiven. And both of those things are tied to him and his name and his reputation. So if you have trouble having confidence in whether or not you're forgiven of your sin and you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you're in him. Remember, you have to be in Christ. You're in Christ through faith. If you're having trouble having confidence, if nothing else, God's going to forgive you for the sake of his own name and his own reputation. Because he said that he would in Jesus Christ. And if he doesn't, he's a liar. And if he's a liar, he's not God. And he's not faithful. And none of his promises can be trusted. So how do we get this? Final thing. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. Go over to Hebrews chapter 9 real quick. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews 9, 22 says this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Okay? So we got the, the Old Testament with the sacrificial system and their shedding of blood. And they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over again because they kept messing up over and over and over and over again. And then Christ comes and the new covenant comes. And go one chapter over to, to chapter 10 in Hebrews. I'm just going to read this to you. For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of their realities... It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. It, it was ineffective. It couldn't do it. Otherwise, verse 2, they would not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once, or they would have, or would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do the will of your will, O oh God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Oh, man, this could be a series of sermons right here. It won't be, I promise. Moving on to verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. He added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first, the old covenant in order to establish the second. He does away with the sacrifices in order to establish righteousness in his own obedience. Verse 10, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once for all time. And every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, reading from that time until his enemies shall be made a footstool for his feet. For by one single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after, uh, for after saying, this is the covenant I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and write them in their minds. That's the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah. He adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Because of the one sacrifice of a perfectly righteous, obedient son offered for all time. That's why we don't do sacrifices anymore. So can you have confidence that you are forgiven and redeemed? That his grace is lavished upon you? Yes, if you trust in the blood of Jesus. 
It's interesting in Hebrews chapter 10, he's talking about the promise. And then in Matthew 26, 28, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he says, this is the blood of the new covenant in my blood for, or this is the uh, blood of the covenant for the forgiveness of sins. In order that he may be our God and we may be his people, that we might be reconciled to God in right relationship with God. That's what we celebrate at the Lord's table. Go back with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So as we approach this table, we approach as those in Christ. And if we are in Christ through faith in Christ and the blood of Christ, the blood washes and cleanses and redeems in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Three brief applications as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Number one, this should result in thanksgiving and worship in joy. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. All of the trash in your closet has been cleaned out. God doesn't look upon it. He looks upon Christ. And if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, Christ is your righteousness. And when you stand before God, you will have nothing to plead on your own behalf, but only the blood of Jesus Christ and his perfect obedience and righteousness. That should bring joy, especially if you struggle with the assurance of forgiveness and pardon and redemption. The, the tone of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 13 or 14 or whatever that I, that I read at the beginning is not gloomy and poopy-faced. TM. It's joyful. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he, it's one sentence. It's so joy-producing within Paul that he doesn't even stop to put a period and start a new sentence. It's one massive sentence in Greek. The whole 13 or 14 verses. Number two, this gives us freedom to forgive others. If I've been forgiven by Christ in this way, I'm free to forgive others because they haven't done to me what I did to Christ. And he freely forgives me. Look at Colossians. You don't have to go there. I'll just read it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Oh, let's start in verse 12. Put on then as Christ's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. You're under obligation to forgive as a believer. Why? Because God's forgiven you. And I think that some of the reason that we don't forgive others willingly and joyfully is because we really struggle with believing that God really forgave us. If we get a grasp of God's forgiveness of us, we'll forgive others. Finally, what was the issue in Corinth? In 2 Corinthians 11, we have one of the major treatments of the Lord's Supper. What was the issue? The issue was divisions. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. They're, they're suing one another. There's rampant sin that's un, uh, unconfessed and no repentance, and they're cool with it. The body is a mess. The church is a mess. There's infighting. There's bickering. There's back and forth. They're not forgiving one another. They're divided. The issue is an issue of unity. 
And that's why Paul says at the end, so wait for one another. The application of the examination is wait for one another. Don't go ahead of other people. Wait for one another. Do it together as a body of Christ. Why? Because the body of Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, have together been redeemed and forgiven in accordance with the riches of God's grace by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is a celebration of the blood. This celebrates our redemption, our forgiveness, our reconciliation. All of the blood-bought promises of God given to us in Jesus Christ. So then we can approach the table with confidence in the blood of Jesus Christ that secures our redemption and forgiveness according to the riches of his grace applied and enjoyed through faith. Let's pray.